Let's start off with what the Neuralink device actually is. It is a brain mapping platform and brain computer interface that hopes to be able to use BCIs to assist amputees in manipulation of their prosthetics. That has been the core goal of this organization from day one, regardless of what Musk has told the world it will be capable of doing. To hear Musk speak on the device, however, he seems to think it's a miracle device that's a cross between the instant gratification style learning in the Matrix, combined with the download capacity of Johnny Mnemonic, and the healing power of the robot chip from Deadly Friend which isn't surprising, since he seems to borrow most of his flashy technobabble straight from the storylines of science fiction tales. So let's get into the presentation Musk gave to the press corps in August of 2020, getting the world caught up to date with Neuralink. The presentation started off with Musk addressing the audience by himself, standing next to the surgical robot that he had no hand in designing, because if he did, his name would have been on the patent. He stated that the primary mission of Neuralink is to solve important brain and spinal problems with a seamlessly implanted device, but then he proceeds to state a bunch of claims, only some of which have anything to do with this primary goal, and yes, we are going to go through every claim that he made later on, point for point. At one point of the presentation, he started to bash the Utah Array. That is the only FDA-approved device in this category. And then he started comparing deep brain stimulation to kicking the TV. That happens to be a therapeutic device for over 150,000 patients. Musk then went on to demonstrate the recent change in the neural link architecture, moving from a device located behind the ear, resembling a hearing aid, to a coin-sized insertion requiring a 23 millimeter wide hole at the top of the skull through the parietal bone next to the sagittal suture, thereby weakening that skull plate. The device was then presented to the gallery. The 23mm device is 8mm thick. Average thickness of the parietal bone is 6mm, plus or minus 1.5mm, so it will either press into the brain slightly or create a bulge in the scalp. In comparison to the Utah Array implantable device, this device is actually massive. The difference is the electronics of a Utah Array are mounted externally. At the 7 minute mark, Musk declares this will be like having your smartwatch or phone directly wired into your brain, with all the same sensors, and he presented the diagram for the device along with the inductive charging system. In fact, he says most of this tech will come straight from smartwatches, making components easy to buy in bulk. At the 9 minute mark, Musk informs the press this open brain surgery will be done in less than an hour, without general anesthetic, and you'll walk out of the clinic with your brand new upgrade like nothing happened. Then he demonstrated the installation procedure video and proceeded to call out his three little pigs. We are meant to believe that of these three pigs, the one named Joyce does not have a link, the one named Dorothy supposedly had a link that had since been removed, and the third called Gertrude seemed to have a link installed that is feeding information to a monitor that is flashing and beeping in real time. Gertrude, however, really was not a happy camper and refused to come out on stage for quite a while. Now, although the audience swooned at the visual and auditory cues, this is actually nothing new. All they did was add a chime to an otherwise unremarkable EEG. And at that point, Musk trotted out the panel that we introduced at the beginning of the episode. Quick disclaimer, we're going to be showing some medical pics and video here, so if you're squeamish, turn around for a bit and just listen. Despite all the hype to the contrary, it should go without saying that open brain surgery is serious business. It is most often used as a last resort, life-saving decision that incurs all kind of risk. The medical term for the procedure is called a craniotomy, when a piece of skull is removed to give doctors direct access to brain tissue to remove a brain tumor, blood or blood clots, relieve pressure after an injury or a stroke, repair a brain aneurysm or skull fractures, or treat other brain conditions. When that procedure is complete, the piece of skull is put back and secured into place after surgery. Risks associated with brain surgery include allergic reaction to anesthesia, bleeding in the brain, clots, swelling of the brain, coma, impaired speech, vision, coordination or balance, memory problems, seizures or strokes. For this installation process, the video demonstrates Neuralink surgeons also have to cut through the three layers of meninges. These are critical protective tissues that protect your brain, cushioning it against the inside of your skull. They also keep cerebral spinal fluid contained, and they protect important blood vessels feeding the brain with nutrients and oxygen through the blood-brain barrier. 
All of these layers protecting your gray matter would have to be breached to install this device. Once exposed, the brain would then be subject to what they describe as a sewing machine type insertion of filaments directly into the brain tissue, 1,024 of them being plunked in by a robot. Although Musk says the robot takes great care to scan the sites so as not to puncture any blood vessels, you can see from this screenshot they certainly don't have that capability yet. All of these ones that are circled appear to have punctured blood vessels of different sizes. Also, the fact that the brains throb and move around quite a bit during this process will not help matters at all. Best case scenario, all goes well and it's time to close up. While in a regular craniotomy, once the procedure is completed, the piece of skull they took away is replaced and screwed back into place to heal. See, your skull is an extremely strong structure when it is fully intact, but yours won't be. The bone is not going back where it came from. By all accounts, the skull is going to be replaced with this device sitting flush to the outside of your skull. That means not only will it not be sitting flush to the inside of your skull, it will result in a lack of integrity across your skull bone, and the pressures in your head will try to release through this weakness. If someone were to smack that particular area, it could send the device directly against the brain or into the brain, or slip it between the brain and the skull, damaging the meninges. It would not be unlike the care and attention required with a newborn's fontanelles, and it would be like that for the rest of your life. Musk has said that eventually this open brain surgery, which will be piercing every layer of protective barrier around your brain, will be conducted entirely by robot, will take less than an hour, that it will be done in about the same amount of time as it takes to get LASIK surgery, and for roughly the same cost. Well, sorry P.T. Barnum, I'm not buying what you are selling. Now that the Neuralink is installed, even if it was safely installed on the top of your head, how do you power it? Well, according to the presentation, the rechargeable lithium-ion battery of the device is taken from other wearables like smartwatches, so it has a battery life of one day. And then, you have to recharge it inductively overnight. Overnight. While you sleep, you will need to somehow attach an inductive charger to the top of your head to charge this device for the following day. It might even look something like this EEG device from Koneonics, but instead plugged into a wall. So you'll have to spend six to eight hours a day with your head immersed in this recharging magnetic field generator, which should be enough for most people to say, I'm out. But for those of you still willing to give it a go, here's some more bad news for you. Batteries that are charged inductively get hot. That's because the batteries cannot absorb all the energy at 100% efficiency, so they tend to overheat. In fact, devices catching fire is not unheard of. This frame shows how the temperature differs between charging directly by cable, having aligned induction, and having induction that is misaligned. The wireless examples are around 4 degrees Celsius hotter than charging by cable, and inside your skull, that heat will have nowhere to go. The temperature of a human brain can fluctuate within a narrow window of temperature tolerance, but if it gets too warm, it starts to misfire and malfunction, and the term for this is heat stroke, which normally starts when the body core temperature hits 40 degrees Celsius. But if your brain is subjected directly to a hot spot in this placement directly on your brain's outer surface, it stands to reason similar symptoms to heat stroke will occur. And of course, if the casing of the device gets breached or dissolves or the device malfunctions in any way, including exposing the battery contents to the corrosive environment of the brain, that's game over for you. It's still amazing that Joe Rogan, who had Musk in his hot seat in May, didn't corner Musk on the claims he was making about his device. So many times he had Musk on the ropes and he just couldn't or wouldn't call him out for whatever reason. Here is the list of claims made during this news conference compared to whether or not they also came up during the Rogan interview, along with the time it was mentioned during the August 2020 presser. It will restore vision. Well, restoring vision is not a function of an implant chip. At best, the chip would be able to take the input of an external camera and pipe this directly into the brain's visual cortex. This is technology that presently exists, with a low success rate and low resolution image. It also takes a considerable amount of time for the brain to adapt to this input. To take it one step further, Musk said that the user would also be able to eventually see with superhuman ability 
using ultraviolet or infrared or x-rays or radar. And that's just pure nonsense on so many different levels since the chip has nothing to do with the input captured by the camera. Restoring hearing. Again, this technology already exists, but it is not a function of any implanted chip. It would require an external microphone to capture the sound, which would then be sent through the chip to the brain's auditory cortex. This is just a version of hearing aids that already exist, or cochlear implants that don't require full open brain surgery. Being a panacea for issues ranging from memory loss to addiction to depression and extreme pain. Generally speaking, there is no cure-all for the items on this list. Strokes cause partial brain damage. Physical addiction is a full body chemical imbalance. Hearing loss occurs as a breakdown between the eardrum and the auditory cortex. What he should put on this list, if he wants them to sell like hotcakes, is tell everybody it'll fix erectile dysfunction. Generalized device for any brain issue. This is too generalized a statement and there's no cure-all for brain injury or disease. Correcting paralysis or quadriplegia. Again, this is not a present technology available with the chip, but it is closer than most other claims to the target result of the actual researchers. But the Scientific American pulled no punches on this claim, saying it's still, quote, a long way off. Curing symptoms of a stroke including palsy. While the chip may be able to stimulate certain areas of the brain and assist in recovery, it will not resurrect dead or injured tissues. This stimulation technology already exists, by the way, with the vagus nerve stimulator, which does not require open brain surgery, although correcting damage in the brain from the stroke itself is often required. Human trials within a year. According to the inventor of two of the patentable concepts, Tim Hansen told the world this technology he helped create is barely suitable for use in animal research. Musk would counter this by saying it's been registered by the FDA as a breakthrough device, which sounds much more impressive than it is. On this chart from the FDA determining criteria for breakthrough devices, Musk barely qualifies even when stating the lofty ambitions he has for the device, never mind the actual practical applications of the technology, since there are already alternatives to many of the attainable claims. The ability to play video games such as StarCraft or Crisis in your head. Simply no. But oddly enough, these claims are what caused the unnamed male moderator of this presentation to perk up twice. Even if it were possible, this is probably the worst reason to undergo open brain surgery and get one of these devices. Full AI symbiosis. This is absolute nonsense. And yet it's probably why Musk is driving this concept so hard. He's paranoid about AI, which is why he and the rest of the people at OpenAI have no common ground. After making some laughable claims about AI and AGI early in the year, Jerome Bassenti, VP of AI at Facebook, took to Twitter and publicly called Musk out about his apparent lack of knowledge on this topic. In retaliation, as he does, Musk attacked Facebook, Bassenti, and Zuckerberg on Twitter and helped prove their point. Telepathic communication. Even if it were possible with this tech, which it isn't, who would want this? First, the ability to speak is not only a necessary aspect of civilization, but the process of speaking allows you to filter what you are saying as you are saying it. Second, when you form a sentence, every word you choose to use is selected from a list of synonyms running in real time in your mind as you express your thoughts verbally. Can you imagine the information overload if you're in somebody's mind as they were making that selection process happen in real time? This really simple flowchart takes you through the permeations of a six word sentence with three synonyms to choose from. This example is confusing enough. Can you imagine trying to convey a complex thought in the same manner? Third, would you really want everyone hearing your thoughts? The Mel Gibson movie What Women Want is a great example why this isn't a great idea. Download a new language at will. Learning does not happen instantly. It requires the creation of appropriate pathways. It requires repetition. It requires comprehension of the material. As small as these implanted filaments are, they are still blunt instruments, affecting far more than a single neuron at a time. In fact, according to Musk, they're affecting as few as 10,000 and as many as a million with every pulse. Again, we go back to the matrix analogy, where this likely all comes from in Musk's head. He thinks this device is a data port that can capture and program information into the human brain. 
and that's why he installed a USB port into the head of this rat. That is a real photo, by the way. Neo plugged into the Matrix Trainer program and learned Kung Fu in a matter of seconds. I know Kung Fu. Even if the brain could take that much information all at once, the body you're in has not changed. Kung Fu is a mental and physical discipline. Muscle groups need to be targeted with exercise. Reflexes need to be honed. Your fast and slow twitch muscle groups need to develop muscle memory for the specific motions. Your respiratory and circulatory system have to be built up to supply those muscles with oxygen or fuel. So you might know the diagrams for the moves, but it doesn't mean that you'll be able to perform them. Let's use a simpler example. You want to use this to cheat at learning how to play guitar. You may be able to download the fingering charts, but your fretboard fingers won't have the calluses required, and you can't expect your strumming or picking fingers to have the dexterity required to play only the strings you're meant to play. Overall, the learning experience is what makes these activities enjoyable, challenging, worthwhile. Downloading an ability, even if it were possible, would cheapen the entire experience. To quote Syndrome, and when everyone's super, <laughs> no one will be. <laughs> See, Musk seems to think if everybody has unlimited access to all the information that's out there in the world, and they can have it pumped directly into their head, that this will be the next level of evolution for humankind that is able to merge with AI. But people have access to that level of information now through their devices. And what has that given us? Anti-vaxxers, flat earthers, chemtrail conspiracists, and moon landing deniers. So that really hasn't worked out too well. And that brings us to an interesting question. Let's say that the end goal for Musk with this is to implant an entire society with these devices. At what point exactly would parents be expected to implant these in a child's brain? The Neuralink is supposedly going to make speech redundant through telepathy according to Musk in the next five to ten years. They're supposed to be able to accommodate video game programs. They're supposed to be able to download huge amounts of information directly to the brain. So do you give it to your newborn or wait until they turn 18? And how are you supposed to interact with these people who don't have one yet? Being able to download a save state that can be transferred to a new body or robot. Sheer, unmitigated bullshit. Nobody else even on that panel believes this is remotely possible. Even if you were able to hijack somebody else's body, or create a blank slate golem like they did in Picard, or took any other automaton device, this would require the transfer of 2.5 million gigabytes of information. And according to MIT, the processing speed of the human brain is now clocked at about 60 bits per second, 8 bits to the byte. So you have fun doing that math. Total Recall of Memories. We're calling this what it is, stolen straight from Total Recall. Full memory recall, complete with full sensory recall, downloadable in seconds with the ability to edit it down or change it at will? Sure, Musk. Just don't try selling me the Super Spy Blue Sky on Mars mission, because we all know how that ended up. Listen, if you're of the opinion that volunteering for a recreational lobotomy is going to somehow make you smarter, you're probably right. But don't assume, even if all these ridiculous claims come to pass, that everybody else either wants or needs to be wired up like Logan Marshall Green was in the movie Upgrade. We would just like to say to the Neuralink panelists, Sam, Autumn, Zach, Felix, Max, Matthew, Robin, Joey, Mystery Man, Paul, Ian, DJ, and Daniel. Just in case any of you need to hear this, we are incredibly sorry that this unscrupulous showman who takes credit for your hard work and your personal genius has absolutely no idea what he's talking about and that he has embarrassed you publicly the way he did. We hope you're able to make great strides forward in your chosen fields and can gather up enough courage in the future to stand up to him, as Tim Hansen did, to tell the world what you're really doing, what is actually capable of, and to leave all of Musk's distracting hype behind. As we were finalizing the content for this video, the MIT Technology Review published an article called Elon Musk's Neuralink is Neuroscience Theater. The author, Antonio Regalado, is one of very few journalists who have been bold enough to go against the grain of this hype to think like a skeptic. 
so we encourage you to give that a good read. Also, just this morning, Futurism's Dan Robitsky released a very rare contrarian piece that cites the MIT doubts and quotes Professor Andrew Jackson's comments to the BBC, stating that this is, at best, mediocre neuroscience, and that it was unfortunate that they are presenting their work this way rather than in peer-reviewed papers that allowed for scrutiny. And PETA, thankfully, has now taken issue with the animal testing now that Musk has revealed his test subjects. They are calling on Musk to use himself as the primary subject if he wants to continue testing the device and to leave these animals be. Thank you for watching this episode of the Common Sense Skeptic, where we are this week celebrating our second month anniversary. If you have any comments about the episodes or additional information you'd like to share about any of the people that appeared on the panel, we would enjoy receiving it and may do a follow-up piece in the future. Hit that like button, leave your comments and questions below, and subscribe to the channel for the next time the Common Sense Skeptic returns. <laughs>